Doctrine does not change lives or the world like love does. You're having coffee with Conrad. Conrad Rocks! Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of Coffee with Conrad. This is Conrad from ConradRocks.net. Rocks of Revelation being poured out to you. My passion is for you to develop a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. We're going to be talking about just that today. I often have to reflect quite a bit before I push send on my tweet or before a Facebook post, or before a Google Plus post. Because I know that there's going to be some blowback from the people that exalt doctrine over love. The real sticklers for doctrine, they sit there and wait for the tweet that they can pounce on. And I've learned that love trumps doctrine. We're going to be talking about that today. When I'm talking today, I want you to think about Jesus' command for us to love one another. For the fact that our love for one another will show that we're the disciples of Jesus. Now keep that in your anchor, in your spirit, as you're listening to this podcast Now, I basically said that doctrine doesn't change lives. Doctrine doesn't change the world like love does. When Jesus was dying on the cross for you and me and our enemies, it was not because of some amazing epiphany of Old Testament Scripture. Remember that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes were attacking Christians because of their stance on Scripture. Now, what's the motivation behind that attack? If you remember, it had a lot to do with, hey, you don't, you don't agree with my doctrine, right? So oftentimes when I'm about to send out a tweet, I realize that, you know, it's only 140 characters. People may not get the gist of what I'm saying, Um they probably don't love me. I'm pretty sure all 34,000 followers of me on Twitter don't love me. And there's a lot of people that just wait for you to say something wrong so they can attack you doctrinally under the umbrella umbrella of Christianity. Now, at first, I'm hurt and I feel misunderstood. But as I pray, you know, this scripture comes to mind in Matthew 5, 10 through 12, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Yeah, it's pretty interesting how the church, I mean, it wasn't called the church in the Old Testament, but they killed the real prophets that had a real relationship with God. So as I'm always talking about having a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus, there's going to be some persecution involved with that. And the Bible says rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Now, I want, to, I want to start out by telling you a story about a man I know. This man is a pastor. He's not necessarily a powerhouse of theology. He's not famous for doctrine, but he is famous for how he loves people. He will lay down his life for friends. Also, there are miracles working in his ministry. Many people have been getting healed. And 
the ministry I'm thinking of works highly in the prophetic, and there are signs that follow them that believe. You know, there's I'm not one to follow signs and wonders, but in Mark 16, 20, it says, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. So, hey, you know, there will be signs if God is with you. Amen? So basically this pastor I'm thinking of, he would pray with his family about people to take into his home. He would mentor them day in and day out and disciple them. He would feed them. He gave them a place to sleep. He would change their lives. He would pour his life into theirs. He would even help them earn a living by helping them with construction work. Not only was he showing them the love of Jesus, he was teaching them how to make a living as well. And one day this pastor told me, Conrad, that washing machine isn't mine. That dryer right there isn't mine. This house, it isn't mine. It's the Lord's. He made sure I had these things. Therefore, I use it for the kingdom of God. And I'm thinking, what better theology could there be than a man laying down his life for his friends? Greater love hath no man. However, you know, I keep up with this pastor over the years, and I see that some people may disagree with some minute points of doctrine, and they leave, even though this man would lay down his life for them as well. That's what a good shepherd does, <laughs> right? And, you know, people are, are leaving because of a small misunderstanding. And I, that's, you see what I'm saying? So doctrine is trumping love in that situation. And this should not be the case. And on a little rabbit trail here, since we're talking about doctrine trumping love, you know, Jesus had the inner circle disciples. Jesus had Peter, James, and John they were really in his inner circle. How many people can you actually love, like a pastor should love, in the Bible? You know, if you're actually the type of person that will lay down your life for his sheep, like Jesus talks about, can you do that with a thousand people in your congregation? I mean, I think it takes, you're going to have to have an intimate relationship with these people. There's something. There's something wrong with the largeness of it. We need to have intimate relationships with people, because Jesus says they will know you're my disciples by the love you have one for another. So we need to have this love. This love is important. It's not. It's more important than numbers. Do you see where the relationship is not as strong as the hate and divisiveness of doctrinal differences? Now, I want to reiterate, I'm all for having good doctrine. Actually, I get excited about doctrine. But we can paralyze ourselves by striving to have a perfect doctrine, and we will find that we're not the type of Christian that will lay down their lives for their friends that don't have the same exact perfect doctrine as we do, even though Jesus died for that person without perfect doctrine. We have to make sure that we don't want to argue and divide because arguments and division, if it's rooted in hate and not in love, we need to examine ourselves to see where we are in the faith. Division has probably got some bad root in it, like pride. I'm right, and pride is the sin of the devil. Now let me ask you this question. Speaking in the context of love, how would you approach your own child if they had incorrect theology? Would you kick them out of the home? Would you lovingly talk to them and hash it out till they understood? How would you handle your brother or sister if they had incorrect theology? Would you kick them out of the home? Would you stop talking to them? Now, as I'm thinking about this, there's a passage in Corinthians that talks about not eating with people. But it didn't talk about anathema excommunication, right? Um, in 1 Corinthians 5, let's say 9, I wrote with you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. You know, not to hang out with them. And company is basically, in the Greek, it's uh, sunamagonomi. <laughs> it means to have no, don't keep company with them, don't associate with them. 
So Paul says, I write unto you in an epistle not to, to company with fornicators. But then he says this. He's talking about, you know, when, how we treat someone, okay, inside the, the body of Christ. Yet not altogether with fornicators of this world or with covetous or extortioners or with idolaters. For them, you must needs to go out in the world. So we need to go out and talk to these people that do these things. Sinners sin in the world. But now he's talking about people inside the church body. In verse 11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetousness or an idolater or a railer or drunkard or extortioner, which someone do not even eat. Now notice that this is not necessarily highlighting doctrine so much as evil doing, fornicating, covetous, idolatry, railer, drunkard, and extortioner. And I'm going to say today we got a lot of them in the church body. <laughs> Just say it. You know, and Paul talks about in 1 Timothy chapter 6, um, let as many servants you under the yoke count their masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. He's talking about doctrine. And that they have believing masters, let them not despise them because they're brethren. Okay, don't despise they that have believing masters, don't despise them because they're brethren, but rather do them service because they're faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit these things teach and exhort if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words even the words of our lord jesus christ into the doctrine which is according to goodliness he's proud knowing nothing but doting about with questions and strifes of words where in cometh envy strife railings and evil surmisings perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself now notice here that people that suppose gain is godliness, we're supposed to withdraw ourselves from them because, well, I'm not going to say necessarily because of the doctrine itself, but this doctrine itself is the fruit of a much deeper problem, and it's not having a relationship with Jesus. Uh, Paul also talks in Second Thessalonians, you know, uh, and if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. But notice, notice how he says to deal with that man. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother, okay? So we tend to treat people as enemies that we disagree with, and Paul even says not to do that. Uh, in Second John, it says, Whoever transgredeth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. See, that's a spiritual relationship. Uh, if they're coming to you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Now, these are, are, are points and examples of people that are, um, yeah, there's going to be a, there's a problem with doctrine, but look at the root. They don't have Jesus and they don't have the Father. Now, as we're thinking about this, Think about the people that confess Jesus as Lord and believe in their hearts that God has raised him from the dead. Now, when we have a disagreement with these people, are we, what are we, how are we supposed to approach them? Even those, he says, even fornicators and extortioners, you know, just don't eat with them. He didn't say kick them out of the church or be anathema. I believe in one of the biggest... Um, problems that Paul had in the in first Corinthians he had a problem with the fornicator um, that was having his father's wife I mean that was terrible and then by the second uh, epistle you know he said turn him over to Satan but by the second epistle you know we can see evidence that the people in that church admonished that man they talked to him and they said look you can't do that and then he repented they didn't just kick him out and say see you later bye right? So he was restored. And and think about people in your own family, because the reason I'm talking about our own family is I believe that the body of Christ should be a family. I, I know we're not there yet, but I believe that Scripture calls for that. I believe that the Spirit of God calls for us to be a family. So when someone of our family members is in sin, okay, we may, like, you know, I can't hang out with you anymore until you get until you get better. But that's the way we approach them. We say, look, you need to repent, and then we'll have fellowship with you.
You know, you don't just excommunicate them out of hate and then just call them evil. You know, we wrestle not with that person that Jesus died for. We wrestle not with flesh and blood. Jesus died for that person, and we should love them as well. Amen? If Jesus wants us to love one another, you know, and they will know that we are his disciples by our love that we have one for another, how should we treat our fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord, even if we disagree with them on minute parts of doctrine? The ones I was just telling you about, those are major departures from doctrine. They're easy. They're easy to see. Fornication, covetousness, idolatry. These are things that are easy. They're not minor. There are some doctrines that are so minor that if we're willing to split hairs over them, we need to ask ourselves where we are in the faith, right? I believe that that technically Pentecostals and cessationists should be able to work together in our communities to transform the world around us for Jesus Christ. Amen? Well, this is going kind of long here, and I have a lot more notes, so I'm going to go ahead and split this up into two, possibly three in the podcast. So hopefully, if you still have some questions in this podcast, in uh, the next podcast, I'll probably deal with that. This may even go three podcasts long. But as you meditate about this, please remember that, you know, as Christians, we're to love one another, and these small petty doctrines that we're actually dividing over, look at the root of that fruit. You know, where where is this hate and division coming from? And also, who is winning? Is it Jesus or is it the devil on doctrinal division? I mean, just think about that. Think about love. God bless you. Thank you for being in my life. And remember, there's going to be at least one more, possibly two more podcasts about love trumps doctrine. Till we meet again, dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher at comraderocks.net.